Thank you for this invitation to come to this meeting. It's also particularly nice to see Radha and Bala in the audience, old friends of mine, colleagues. Um, I want to talk really about models in this particular talk, about simulations, what are called counterfactuals, and how they impact policy. So this is a quote from a talk that Srinath Reddy gave a couple of days ago, former head of PHFI, the inauguration of the NIHR Global Research Center for Multiple Long-Term Conditions. He said, we require interdisciplinary approaches as well as an understanding of complex systems. And this is a line that could have been taken from any complex systems talk slash paper that also speaks to your own interest at IIT Madras in complex systems. But he was talking completely about health in India. So I want to discuss models of some different types that we have been working with, tell you where they intersect with policy and where we have been thinking about policy questions in the context of those models. I'll tell you a little bit about Bharat Sim, which is our own effort at creating a large-scale agent-based model for looking at not just disease, but a bunch of other questions relating to society and disease together. And then finally, summarize. So let me start with the canonical models for disease, the compartmental models. And in this case, the model that we worked on called INSISIM. INSISIM, Indian scientists, response to COVID-19 simulation model is really where that particular term comes from. I'll talk a little bit later about network models and then about agent-based models. But this is the main paper where we looked at modeling the first wave of COVID-19 in India. This came out a few months ago. So when one begins to model, one needs some idea of what the disease progression is like. And COVID-19 is in some ways fairly similar to other types of diseases of the same variety of respiratory diseases. There is some fraction of people who are asymptomatic for who are infected asymptomatically. They will not show symptoms. There's some fraction of people who would be mildly infected. They will not need to go to hospital. And there are people who are severe and critical. And the people who are critically infected will die. And there are some ideas for what we have for now for how long you spend within these sub-compartments of exposed, infected asymptomatically, recovered, infected symptomatically, pre-symptomatic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this defines for us the way we think about the typical progression of the disease. And of course, across different ages, this may manifest somewhat differently, but we can use this as a good starting point. So that's what we... Yeah, so that's, that's infected asymptomatic, infected symptomatically. So you can be infected without showing symptoms, and that's the IA. So the first wave of COVID-19 in India, if you remember, looked a little bit like this. And this is a, an example. First, on the top, you can see the cases across the first period of January to February, January 2020 to February 2021. And February 15, 20, et cetera, is when the, the devastating second wave of COVID actually started. So we stop at that point. And below, you can see the, the, the timeline of deaths, the 100 deaths, 1,000 deaths, 10,000 deaths, et cetera. And the little box over there is the period of the lockdown that happened. We can incorporate this information, how cases changed, how deaths changed, the lockdown, reduction of transmission during lockdown, et cetera, into models. And the model that we have here is a model called the incisive model, as I said. And that is a nine compartmental model. Compartmental models for disease are like little boxes in which you put different categories of people. Initially, everyone starts susceptible with a small number of people who are infected. That infection then begins to spread. People then move from a susceptible compartment to an exposed compartment where they're infected, but they do not begin to show symptoms yet. You can then go into pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic compartment. Most people infected with COVID-19 will move into an asymptomatic compartment. From there, they will then recover. But people who are pre-symptomatic will then develop symptoms So IS, is a symptomatic infected compartment. I am the mildly infected compartment. Symptomatically infected can go to hospitalize and then go to the dead compartment or then recover. And these rates that move people between these compartments are all known from various versions of COVID-19 epidemiology, incorporated from data across the world, incorporated from data from what we know in India, and also incorporate, also we put in information about how the disease differentially affects people with different age groups. For example, the age 0 to 9, or the age 40 to, 40 to 49, etc. All of this information isn't there. So this is age structure. There are nine age brackets. There are nine compartments in here. So there are technically 81 equations that you have to solve. These are nonlinear, coupled to each other. The contact structure. So we put in the information that we know about social contact between different age groups. As Ramanan pointed out, much of this is diagonal. So most people tend to interact with their own age groups. We put that information in there into these models based on what we know of social information in India. And finally, we incorporate all of this into a Bayesian framework where we don't prescribe point values, but distribution of functions for most of the important quantities that enter the model. So the paper itself has an analysis of how COVID-19 spread across major Indian cities. We look at Bombay, Delhi, Pune, Bangalore, etc. 
as well as states. We look at the state of Karnataka specifically as an example. And so you can see there, you can, the, the dots there are the day-to-day -day cases, cases and deaths. And then you can see our predictions there with various bands that you can see across these and how we project the changes in these quantities across. From here, we can then go back and ask what were the infection fatality ratio that would have given these? What is the fraction of cases that remained undetected? What is the number of people who were infected at the end of the pandemic? And that's important because this sets the initial condition for what happened in the Delta wave. So we estimate so that the our bottom line results are about 35% of people were infected at the end of the first wave of COVID-19, so entering into by, by the 15th of February of, of 2021. We, had, have, we find an infection fatality rate ratio of about 0.1% with, uh, with a bound of 0.05% to 0.15%. This is a little conservative with respect to numbers that have been used, but it's roughly consistent with the fact that the first wave is believed to have been milder than the second wave of COVID-19 in India. The case undercount towards the end, we were counting one, you know, we, we were missing 19 cases out of every 20 that was actually there. Initially, we were missing one out of every 100. We were missing 99 out of every 100. We undercounted deaths by a factor of somewhere between 2 and 5 is our best guess. We settled on 2.2 to do some of the computations, but that number could potentially move a little higher. And again, somewhat conservative with respect to the numbers that have been talked about. There's no doubt that really the large proportion Contribution to the deaths came from the second wave and not so much from the first wave, but this is the best that we have and we can figure out from here where it is at the nature of the undercounts, where in the approximation that we make do these undercounts actually figure. So we can use models like these to make much more specific projections. So this is the work that we did with the Andhra Pradesh government, looking at weekly projections. As, as Mother pointed out, one shouldn't project too far in the future. And should ideally look about a week to 10 days because things are not expected to change much over that time. But over longer periods of time, behavior modifications, new variants, etc. will then begin to enter. So this was a week to week projection that we actually made. And you can see the quality of the fits to the actual data. So we can, between different districts in Andhra, we can do the same. What is the nature of the undercounting? What are the number of cases that we expect? What are the number of hospitalizations that we expect, etc. And this is an example where the government actually went in to ask for a certain number of drugs to look for a certain level of drug procurement based on what we told them might be expected in the weeks to come in different parts of the pandemic. So that's where policy enters, policy in terms of commitments of government money to, to given a certain understanding of what is expected in the future. So that can be expanded into much more complicated and yet compartmental models. And these are models that incorporate vaccinations. So the, this is three little boxes there. The sub box of the box at the top is the unvaccinated. The box in the middle is the vaccinated with one dose. And the box at the bottom is vaccinated with two doses. And then you can put various connections between them. The likelihood that someone who's vaccinated with one dose will die or with two doses will die or will go, will exhibit symptoms that are mild or strong, etc., etc. Based again on what we know about the disease, what we know about when by then, this is fairly recent data. So this is looking at data in the earlier part of this year from Andhra Pradesh specifically and asking what might be the effects of these interventions on that particular case. So again, we looked at school reopening within Andhra Pradesh where we knew when schools reopened and the expectations for what we could say, what might happen as a consequence of school reopening versus what actually happened in that particular case. We looked at the impact of Omicron. Again, this is something that Rajesh and other people have set up a very nice website at that time, which integrated multiple projections from different groups. And that's at least an example where more or less people got it right. They got the location of the peak right, the spread of the peak right, the number of cases, the relative mildness of the Omicron variant correctly, more or less. And that's certainly a sort of positive. Um, so I want to talk now about a different set of models. These are network models that we began to look at to understand, again, specific questions of policy. And here the questions are, India uses two COVID-19 tests. One is the high sensitivity RT-PCR test. The other is low to intermediate sensitivity, rapid antigen test, or the RAT. So this has been an, an intense debate. What is a fraction of tests that you should use? And let me tell you all the parameters here. The RAT test is a slower test to return results. Typically, it will be between 8 to 24 hours. And in the peak of the Delta wave in Delhi, pretty much you got your results back after you were either recovered or died from COVID-19 if you were symptomatic at the beginning. It's also a more expensive test. And whereas the RAT is cheaper, but it's, a little, it's believed to be more accurate as well. So that's a trade-off. It's a more expensive test. Its results come a little later, but it's more accurate. The rapid antigen test is less accurate. It's a point-of-care test. You get your results in 15 to 30 minutes. But it's, it's also cheaper. 
So what is the right mix of, of these two tests that one should use for optimal public health use? And this is again a question that governments have to worry about. They need to balance budgets in terms of how, given the money that you have, how should you divide it between these two different types of tests? So how much should you be testing? What is the optimal mix of tests? What does it depend upon? And as you change the cost, so remember there was an intense uh, negotiation with suppliers that drove the cost of RITs down from about 3,500 rupees to 1,500 or less. And this again factors, because again this is a moving target. So as the prices of the relative pricing of these tests change, you have to then reconsider what you would do and what might be the optimal mix. So what we do here are these models in which you have homes, hospitals, workplaces, etc. You model 20,000 individuals within a certain network. There are, you distribute them across different households according to a certain deal distribution. Mean number of individuals per household is say three, somewhere between three and four. It has a longish tail on one side. You have some idea of what the distribution of people in workplaces is. You have people who are specifically assigned to healthcare situations such as hospitals, and you allow for movement between them. So you say you have you work you're at home for twelve hours, you're at workplaces for twelve hours, you switch back and forth, and if you're infected and you're symptomatic, you move to hospital. And then you can test within this group at random. And that's essentially what we do. We test, we pick up people, test them, and then you can impose different conditions upon them. What happens if you return the result of the test somewhat late, but meanwhile allow them to circulate? You can look at all of these variations and then combine all of this information into looking, first of all, at how disease spreads on the network and how people get infected and then later recover. And then you can finally look at graphs like this, where you can vary the fraction of the RAT, so that's this axis here, that's between 1 and 0. You can look at the sensitivity of the RAT test, which is, I mean, the, the minimum required is 50%. Indian tests were somewhere between 60 to 70% at the time that this was done. You can look at different daily testing rates. And your, your readout is, who were the, how, what is the number of people infected right at the end of, pan, of the pandemic? And then you can see that if you vary these as you move around in the space of how much you're testing, what is the, what is the sensitivity of the test, what is the fraction of the RAT versus PCR, you're somewhere on this particular curve. You can look at varying quarantine procedures, if you quarantine immediately the moment someone is tested, if you allow them to move around for two days, if you introduce a delay in the returning result of the test, etc., you can see how these curves begin to vary. And typically, your, the sort of final result is how many people were infected at the end of the pandemic. You can look at the costs of these tests, you can look at imposing further um, non-pharmaceutical interventions such as masking, etc., and ask how does this combine with your testing regime and what difference does it actually make. So. You can, you know, you can finally also look at the costs of these regimes and ask what is what is the nature of, 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 one, of one approach versus the other. And this turned out to be interesting because the result that we derived for this turned out in general to be also applicable to others, other LMICs. And our bottom line was that, you know, less sensitive COVID-19 tests may still work, have the same effect as all RT-PCR regimes, provided you test enough. And that was this, the sort of single most important contribution that we made on this. We looked at school closures, again, if you will remember, a fairly intense point of debate around the middle of last year, when people were, con were, con were contemplating the opening of schools. And again, here you can generalize these network models to include homes, schools, workplaces, etc. In schools, you can define different classrooms that people are assigned to depend on their age. And then you can ask, given a certain prior level of infection within the community, a certain level of seropositivity, what would happen if you reopen schools at that particular point? You can do exactly the same as we did earlier. There's no, you can incorporate testing in this, quarantining, etc., or just look at the growth in cases along with the vaccination program. So you can look, for example, at the increase in cases in adults, 18 plus, or in the low risk category, the 0 to 18 years, with vaccinations, without vaccinations, etc., and ask what is optimal policy to do at that particular point. So this is contained in a report that we wrote for the WHO SAGE, but we wrote up a, a somewhat more informal version of these results for the Hindu. And again, this is a point where one, one begins to take results that are derived from models that one has now benchmarked and believes in and tries to understand what are the policy implications. The policy is very simple. Do you open schools or not? Under what conditions should you open schools? What do you expect in terms of the number of cases when schools are actually reopened? So we said that schools really ought to be reopening at this point. And some, this was listened to in some quarters, we hope. But it's certainly clear that schools were closed for far too long in India. And that the other, the sort of knock-on consequences of that, is something that we will probably experience in the years to come. It's something that is really deferred at the moment. The last thing I want to talk about is a class of models called agent-based models. And 
this goes into the question of if you had access to all health and social information you needed about each person in a population, would that help you understand disease progression any better? Would it also help you understand social determinants of disease? For example, Ramanan had pointed out this very interesting piece of data on looking at toilet availabilities, infrastructure within the house, etc., and what impact that had. And the, in fact, the fairly large impact that had on the progress of the disease across different subpopulations of the target population in Madurai. You can also use this to understand what interve interventions might work and what might not work and what parts of the population they should be targeted against. And one way to do this is to construct digital twins was a term that was used earlier. We prefer synthetic population. Synthetic population that we can then use that replicate the actual population as closely as possible. But then we can try these computational methods out on. So you represent every individual in the population as an agent. You attribute, you assign attributes to that agent, what age they are, where do they stay, where do they go to work, what are their family sizes, what are their pre-existing conditions, what are their economic status, etc. And then incorporate this into a model that says, if I now introduce a disease into this, and I say the disease transmits between people if they're in close physical contact, so typically in a home setting or in a work setting, and then just run this as a simulation, what would I be able to save, extract from this? And is there any way of doing something in real time from computations of this sort? The difficulty is here, of course, so this, this is a, a project called Bharatsan, which is supported both by, by the Gates Foundation and by um, Enthesis. The website is over here for anyone who wants to use it. It's publicly available. This is a computational model that simulates disease spread. It's a framework, so you can alter it in whichever way. It's not, it's not a static piece of code. It's adaptable. One can implement multiple interventions in here. It's designed to work with a large number of agents, all the way from about 100 or 1,000, all the way to about 20 to 50 million. It's, it can incorporate geography, it can incorporate a geographical information system on which it actually sits. And the real, you know, the India-specific part of this goes into the synthetic population for the agents. And that's where one has to include all Indian information, exactly as, as, as uh, Mother mentioned, that is obtained from multiple databases and then synthesized into one common group. So one, an ultra-large scale synthetic population, a simulation framework, and a vis visualization tool is what this paradigm actually contains. So as I said, one can look at communities if you wanted to look at school reopening, look at districts if you wanted to look at the effects of localized lockdowns, look at statewide measures also with the same heterogeneity that was described earlier. If you look at, at, at restrictions imposed by the state as well as by the district separately. And you can look at a country and include the effects of migration between states. So this is work on Pune City. And here the, the you construct a synthetic population for India as a whole, for the states of India, including the IHDS, the census from 2011, and it says census and coordinates for all the villages, district boundaries, etc. that we have. And we're able to now put in variance, non-pharmaceutical intervention, behavior, economic decisions, etc. And this is an example of the wards in Pune to the left and how diseases spread across those wards. This is a, the picture to the right was actually a GIF, which has now vanished when it converted into PDF. But you could have seen in Bombay how different wards of Bombay showed, showed you a change when you seeded a disease as part of that. We can look at multiple variants. So this is two variants in the city of Pune. One sort of milder variant, the second a more transmissible variant that you can actually see. You can see the peak come down. You can now say that given that you had a prior infection with the first variant, that was somewhat protective against the effects of the second variant. How much, what would the changes in the symptomatic infected actually be? What would the changes in the number of people dying actually be? You can now do this at a much more granular level because you can do this at the level of each individual ward within a city, given the information that you have that is more granular at that particular scale. So let me sort of wind up by saying that what I illustrated here was a variety of different models. Each of them have their specific use. Compartmental models are easy to use, they're intuitive, they're very fast to run, and you can customize, you can make them very, very technically adept at doing, asking, at answering the sort of question that you want them to answer. Network models, a little more complicated, but that actually includes the social connection between people. And now you need information about social contacts and social network that actually feed into this. The agent-based models are the most granular of models. They have every individual is separate in those models, but they carry a large computational overload. And you have to decide what information is relevant, what is not, and to what extent it feeds. And so there's much more actual modeling going on at that level, as opposed to the other thing where it's confined to a set of small number of parameters that actually enter these models. I described models for policy, and as, as was stressed earlier, ensembles really are the right way to go. And this is something, again, that, that we have discussed in, in multiple contexts, you should not rely on one particular model and its results. What should be done is to combine the results of multiple models, weight them appropriately based on their past performance, and reweight them 
as you go along. So the models that do well historically can then be favored. We need more data from India, both epidemiological as well as clinical data, so that we can customize these models to the Indian population. And also, as I said earlier, complex systems approaches, interdisciplinarity is important and very crucial to the way one thinks about these problems. We've begun some work on this in looking at contact patterns in, uh, in, in, in a North Indian village. This is with, with a group at Ames and asking how these contact patterns vary across season, between the warm season, the cold season, the wedding season, etc., etc. Because now we can now be a little more specific about how we incorporate this information into both agent-based models as well as the, 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 the network model that I told you about. We need to improve synthetic populations and the only way we know of doing it is to have better surveys so that we can get all of the information on a particular subpopulation at a time. We are now working with some groups that collect social data to actually extract this. We have data from the north, south, east, west, urb, central, urban, rural. Then we will have some seed of the sort of information that we want to collect in terms of both the multiple parameters that characterize the population and how that, the nature of contacts within that population and how dead disease might spread within that. Of course, clinical collaborations are very important here. That's again where Ashoka has moved a little bit in setting up a number of collaborations with hospital chains. I mentioned this as things that your center should potentially be interested in setting up right at the beginning. And it's important to have this level of data to establish relationships of trust with institutions that have this, to be able to put in mechanisms for privacy preservation of the data that you might collect or you might share with them. And that's where we've also been working towards working with these multiple institutions. So just a large number of people to thank multiple groups at Pune, Chennai, Bangalore, Sonipur, Johns Hopkins, WHO, etc. Et I just put this, this bunch of names up of people. And um, Brian Wall is a name that is common to both Ramanans in my presentation. And lots of people to thank. But in fact, the people to thank I have to fit it onto this list. It's just collaborators. Thank you. There's actually a question I wanted to ask the previous two speakers as well as you. Um, so now we have three years of uh, COVID-specific epidemiological modeling. We have a reasonable understanding of the variants, the effect of vaccines and so on. And we have a laboratory situation right now unfolding in China where most of the population is not previously exposed. Uh, some known fraction is vaccinated with vaccines that the West believes at least is not very efficacious. And they're basically releasing all controls now. What do these models predict for China? Would, uh, because it's easy to predict the past, uh, but what can you say about the future now? I think most models predict an increase in cases and a fairly sort of strong increase in cases. But to what extent measures that the Chinese government can take to prevent spread, or at least slow it down, is, built, is, is really an imponderable at the moment. So we don't know. They've, they have relaxed in certain ways. But whether they will reimpose these conditions, if they see the number of cases going up, is, is unclear at this point. You don't need a model to predict that cases will increase. Anyone can say that. Uh, let me go back to the Delta wave in India. There were signs, no model predicted it. But going back to February 2021, people on the ground were reporting that something is happening in Namravati district and so on. And um, if the people who were actually doing ground level, uh, and if we had had better variant tracking, sequencing, and so on at that time, uh, we would have taken it much more seriously, much more early. Um, in China, we all know it's going to go up. The question is, are hospitals going to be overwhelmed? Are people going to die? Uh, what can models say about that kind of thing, including what we know about variants, what we know about uh, possible immunity levels in China, and so on? Yeah. So I don't know what currently the models say about that particular question in terms of deaths. And, and uh, it's obvious that a fair number of the population has not been exposed, has not have hybrid immunity. In fact, ideally, some mild infection in advance, plus a reasonably good vaccin vaccination, will protect you better than just the vaccination itself. And the Chinese vaccine is not known to be as efficacious as the other ones. So I don't have a number. I don't have a sort of direct answer to that question. Whether we will know whether we will know those numbers is not very clear, based on what information that is coming out of China. But that's certainly an inter that's certainly the next sort of frontier of where we might see a large increase in cases across the globe. Much of the globe has already been infected, otherwise. Yeah. So, so my question is much more technical. Uh, 
So you had this 80 compartment, compartmental model, and then you put vaccines in it, it probably became a few hundred. So, and if you were to do variants, it'll probably become much more. What kind of computation time were you playing with? Was it manageable or? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the multi-compartmental models are easily manageable. It's basically it's nine, it's nine, it's nine, and it's nine sub-compartments. These three boxes and various other types. But it's not, it's still about 80 to 100 equations. And more than that, actually about 200 odd. But so that's manageable. That's not, that's not a serious sink of time. And then you had a Bayesian feature to all of this. So as I presume all these parameters have a prior. Yeah. How do you exactly update them? Uh, Standard Bayesian methods, we can, not all of them have priors, we just chose a bunch of, I think, six or eight important quantities for which we chose appropriate priors and, as, you know, as, 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 um, as neutral as we could make them. But then, you can, th these are all constrained in multiple ways in terms of the, the cases, the, the deaths, etc., etc. So, finally, what we get is a reasonable representation of, in terms of the posteriors. So, this is kind of, you have these priors, you observe actual data, yes. and then you get a posterior. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. clarification, you let the distributions yeah. evolve? the distributions evolve, the distributions evolve. The synthetic populations you mentioned, what kind of heterogeneity do you assume in that? So there's, so we don't assume anything that's not there. So the idea is you take your synthetic I mean, population, you, for instance, you compose, have compose. the same proportion of income of as the real population or living exactly. conditions of exactly. the real population. So and what's in the strength of the synthetic population in your modeling? The strength? Yeah, what would be the number? Oh, we can go. Right now, the idea is to create a population with the whole of India. So, 1.4 billion. It's like a list oh. with, with 1.4 billion people. <laughs> so, we work really on sort of sub parts of that. So, we look at we look at Karnataka, or we look at Pune okay. City, or Bombay, etc. Okay. Et but the idea is that the final synthetic population will have all of India. Essentially, will represent population. the entire population of India. Let's thank Professor Gautam again.